lezione che ho pensato di, eh, di dare a, anche agli studenti. Eh, James è qui per, eh, perché lavora un po' con me questa settimana, viene dall'Università di Santa Cruz in California e si occupa di eh, game e storytelling, per cui eh, si occupa di expressive media in particolare e tecniche di intelligenza artificiale per i media espressivi, per cui eh, l'abbiamo invitato appunto a lavorare con me questa settimana ed era un'ottima lezione per un po' di corsi che stiamo tenendo io e Pizzo per cui eh, abbiamo pensato di unificare un po' di lezioni per oggi. Vi parlerò di un'applicazione che riguarda appunto un contesto di una storia dentro un gioco e mette insieme algoritmi e aspetti di rappresentazione logica e aspetti di eh, performance per cui è abbastanza complesso. La lezione di oggi è proprio una lezione più di algoritmi eh, James è proprio una persona che è qui perché è come voi, nel senso che lui ha un background in uh, humanities, in particolare linguistica, per cui, eh, e poi è passato a un laboratorio di gaming eh, con uh, Michael Matthias che eh, ha prodotto Fassade. Con, uh... First the vignette, you are a player in a game, you are outside a bar in an American small town. It's neon lights quicker. You walk inside the bar. Do you find a jukebox, another ephemera of Americana? You walk to the bar. Two patrons have stopped by for a drink. They've lived out a life up to this moment. They've lived out a day up to this moment. Maybe the man on the right has had a rough day, hence the two drinks. You approach him. You ask him a question, how are you? He responds, everyone at the bar is listening. Everyone at the bar can speak. They each lived out lives, have experiences in this town. They have memories, belief, friends, enemies, families, jobs, romantic lives. You can ask them about any of that. They can ask you about yourself. You leave the bar. You leave its neon flickering lights. You walk down the street to somewhere else in this town. It's filled with businesses, homes, and many characters, each of whom has beliefs, experiences, memories, friends, family, jobs, love lives. You can go about this town asking anyone anything narrative intrigue about. This is all made possible by a framework called Talk of the Town. That's what we're going to be talking about here. It's a simulation of a small American town that can be used in video games, dramatic performances, and other procedural experiences. Most notably, it's been used in an experience called Bad News. This is a collaboration with myself, Ben Samuel, and Adam Somerville. I'm going to talk more about Bad News later. Um, in the meantime, we're going to find out how it would be possible to procedurally generate a town like the one I just described in this experience, how it would be possible to procedurally enable the kind of experience that I just described. So we're going to talk about how to make an American small town. My name is James Ryan. A little bit about me before I begin. I have an interdisciplinary background. I think this room is very interdisciplinary from what I hear. I came out of linguistics originally, that was my um, but when I learned to program, it changed my world. It totally changed my life. I knew that that's what I wanted to be. Um, I could see that computation had this absurd expressive and authorial uh, power that I hadn't anticipated. I didn't want to learn to program. I did begrudgingly when I did. It absolutely changed everything for me. So I came uh, to computation from the social sciences. I was already interested in film literature and humanities. So like you, I came at it from the cooler stuff, um, but found in the middle a lot, of, a lot of brightness for cool, expressive works. So I ended up going into computational linguistics. This is the intersection between linguistics and computer science. And then eventually I got into expressive artificial intelligence. Like I said earlier, that's tweeting AI as an expressive medium, as a medium for art, for uh, expressive and creative purposes. So talk of the town. Um, is one of my, my main projects. It's a simulation of a small American town. And what I'm going to do is describe how 
the framework builds up a town by simulating its history year by year. And we're basically going to build this town together. Of course, this is a software framework. It's written in Python. Uh, I won't be showing hardly any code. I will be showing some pseudo code. You should My understanding is I'll show some code. I'll show a lot of pseudo code. I'm going to explain everything visually as well. Hopefully, this will all come together uh, to support some kind of understanding. You might be asking why an American town, why a town, why a small town. Uh, it's American because I'm American. And that's if you're going to author something, don't try to take material that you don't understand. Just start with what you already understand. Well, I'm American. It's going to be easier for me to simulate it. Uh, and it's a small town because of this thing. Computer memory constraints. So I talked about all these characters living out lives, having experiences, being able to speak. Uh, that takes up a lot of memory. And originally we set out to build a city simulator, which would be filled with all these people, and it just wasn't even remotely possible given today's computing out there. So it's a small town because, uh, as you'll see, we'll eventually have around like 300 characters, and they all take up a lot of memory. So about 300 characters is all that I can get. Uh, that's why it's a small town. So throughout, we're going to be going through the algorithm for building the town. This will be a simplification, of course, but it'll really get uh, the details across, or the, uh, the opposite, it'll get the sense across of how it works. So this is going to be pseudocode for the algorithm, and we're going to go through line by line. By the end, we'll reach the bottom of this, and we'll have a small town. So the first step in the process is to set the current date of the simulation. So we're going to start at the beginning of a town, and then progress forward in time, simulating the events of the town throughout that history. And when we stop, we have a town filled with characters who live out lives. So to start, we need to tell the simulation what year is it right now? What is the date? So uh, the simulation knows when things should start because of this. This is actual Python code. And I can change any of these parameters as an author. And this simply says, what year the simulation will begin, 1839 currently, what month, and what day, so August 19th. I can change that to 1945, I can change that to 1600. In the case of American history, it makes no sense to do that. I'm amazed by all your buildings that are more than like 40 years old. We do 1839 with bad news. Uh, it shows that for a couple reasons. Uh, most American small towns started around this time. So we're going to start in 1839. So we tell the simulation, the current date is now 1839. And now we're going to move to the second step. Here we initialize the town. Currently the town does not exist, it's in the ether. We need a physical representation of the layout. So in the talk of the town framework, a town <coughs> is a grid of blocks, like a city block. A town is a grid of blocks. And this grid is on a simple coordinate system. As you can see, it's a 9 by 9 grid. In programming, we start counting at 0. I assume you have So, 0 to 8 is the numbering of the columns. 0 to 8 is the numbering of the rows. Simple coordinate system like basic geometry. And so if we want to know, for instance, where is this block located, we just look up these two numbers there. It's at 4, 6. This is nice because we can take any two places and figure out how far away each block is composed of four parts. Each of these is called a block. Blocks are the things in the grid. Those break down into four of these. This is a lot. A lot is just a place where a building can go. So a lot can be empty. There's nothing built on it. It can have a house on it, or it can have a business. Those three things are the only states a lot can be in. And just like we can get the distance between any two blocks, we can get the distance between any two lots. Same principle. So I said the town looks like this. It's a grid of these blocks. Uh, actually, a couple will be bigger, just to be more interesting. So these bigger ones are called tracks. So a tract is just like a lot. It can be empty, and it can have a business. Certain kinds of businesses go on a tract. A farm is too big for a little lot. Uh, a rock quarry is too big for a little lot. Certain kinds of businesses go on these big lots, which are called tracks. There's no homes on tracks. Um, you could have an estate or something. 
So, town looks something like this. Each of these can have nothing on it or a business. Each of these breaks into four parts called lots. A lot can be empty, can have a home, or a business. So these are the building blocks. This is essentially what the town is made of. And we can use this as a little key up here in the top to visually represent a town. So that's an empty town. But then a real town, the one we're going to build, in fact, will look something like this. So we see a number of businesses. There's a sort of town center in the, in the business district in the center. Um, a couple of places are still not built upon, but almost everywhere else is residential. So our job is to go from this empty town to something that looks like that. That's going to be the year 1979, so it'll take a lot of history. So, as I said, our second step is to initialize an empty town, something like that. Uh, we have an algorithm that does this. I'm not going to get into that. That's not that interesting. We're going to call it Lombardo. Um, <laughs> thank you. This is America, so we won't pronounce it correctly. Lombardo, or uh, however I butcher it, is how we'll pronounce it. And we're starting in 1839. We need that. Population is currently zero. Empty town. Lombardo, USA. Okay, we have an empty town, right? Now we move on to the next step, which is, is to establish a few first businesses. So no one even lives in this town. The way they're going to get there is a couple businesses will start off, and somebody needs to work those businesses. Here's actual code again. So there's a number of different types of businesses. This is just a sampling. There's closer to 100. And you'll notice there's sort of from different eras, because of course we're simulating American history in a sense. So in 1839, there's probably not going to be a taxi parlor in the town. It could be very progressive, but I don't think so. Not in Lombardo, Minnesota. And uh, for instance, in 1979 or today, there's not going to be a blacksmith shop. Right. So we have a number of different kinds of businesses here from different years in American history. But the simulation doesn't know a tattoo parlor is out of place. So we need to tell the simulation when it's appropriate to have different kinds of businesses. And that's what this code does here. It defines businesses in part according to when they are historically accurate or uh, relevant. And how it does that is through three different fields. The first field says this year is when it's appropriate to start having a business of that type. So in 1970, you can start having tattoo parlors pop up. In 1945, after the war, you can start having supermarkets emerge. <laughs> in US history. If they have parents, the parents name character. They might name for a relative. I was named for my father, so it might work something like that. That's my actual family tree. Uh, 
they might just name them not for anything that they know, but a name that's popular or in style. It's one of my favorite details of the simulation. I was able to find the top 200 baby names each decade in American history for both male and female names. So, sorry, I got it in your slide. Um, let's say it's 1839, which would be in here, and a baby is born. The system will look up the top 200, let's say it's a baby boy. The system will look up the top 200 baby boy names in the 1830s, and for each there's a probability, which corresponds to the proportion of American baby boys in the 1830s that got that name. So it's really nice because uh, we naturally get these sort of names for each generation. Um, these probably wouldn't cross over well between our two cultures, but for instance, in the 1800s, we have like the Elmers and the Mods and the Arthurs and so forth, and then we get like the Marys and the Bees, and then the 60s, the Denny's, and then we get to the Aidens eventually or whatever. So it's cool because in bad news, and a lot of people have commented on this, when you're going around the town and you hear that someone is named um, Elmer or something, you know that's an older person. You can sort of tell how old people are just by their name, and it's all by the strip. You're just looking at what were common names at the time that that character was born. So if they need to name a character, it might be named for a family member, <laughs> otherwise names according to actual baby names for that decade. Otherwise, we generate a name. So this produces a person. So this produces a person, and just running back through this, how we created this particular person here. So we determine their sex, Let's say it was male. We determine their sexuality. Let's say it's interested in women. And what do we do here? This is that character that's coming in to be the first person in the town. So we're going to go through that block on this block. And we generate an appearance for him. I'm not going to bore you with the 40 traits that he got. You can imagine that for yourself. Actually, I like to remember that. Uh, then we got his personality, same principle. We got his name, and for this I actually just quickly generated the town and figured out the first person's name, and it was Arthur Earl Belden. So that's going to be the first person who will own that first business. Remember, we got here because we were trying to generate that farm. So now we go back to this subroutine. So of course when you're executing the program, it's a lot of this function calling another function calling another function, and you go nested further and further, and then you make your way back. So we're trying to start this business. We have an owner. Next step, have that owner purchase a lot in the town. There's all these lots that you can start a farm on. But for business types, like I mentioned earlier, some can go on lots, the smaller ones, some can go on tracks, the bigger ones. Farm can go on a track. So you're really picking between these three, because there are three tracks in the town. And he does this by scoring. So he decides between them, as we do when we make decisions, in a sense, by weighing the options. And he weighs them by giving each a score according to a set of rules. So the only rule that he'll be looking at, because no one lives in this town, is that he wants it to be kind of close to the center of town. He doesn't want to be in the outskirts of town. <coughs> so he gives it a score which is negative it's distance from town center. So that one's closer, let's say. So he picks this one here, and now we have our first business. By the way, this notion of scoring different options. In AI, that's called utility-based action selection. So he has to decide between an action, between candidate actions. The actions are starting to farm on that track, starting to farm on that track, starting to farm on that, that track. He gives them each utility by thinking about these tools, and then he picks accordingly. So, he's got a lot. Now he needs to move to the town. I say if necessary, because people that already live in the town could have started the business, but no one lives in this town. So he has to move there. And to do this, he's going to do the same thing. Score all of these according to a set of rules. The only rule that's going to matter right now is that he doesn't want to live super far away from where he works. He wants to be close to the town, not to the farm. So that's why there's the ones all around in the lots next to the farm. Let's say he picks that one. 
And now we have a house and a business, and we have a resident. And what it's going to do, because he came from outside the town, is that it's going to randomly decide whether or not he already had a family. And let's say that he already had a wife. And so these two are going to move into that house, and now it's a very small town. <laughs> and certainly he's the only one that works there. And for a farm, that might make sense. For many businesses, they need employees. And in this case, a farm needs an employee too. So his next step is to hire employees for each ship. So Talk of the Town simulates by two time steps, day and night. So a day happens, and then a night happens. There's not one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, and so forth, day and night. And the reason I did that is to keep things simple. For each shift in the day shift and the night shift at this job, for each position needed for the shift. So each business has something like this. This is again actual Python code. And it says, for the day shift, here's all of the types of occupations a farm needs. For the night shift, the farm's closed. We're not working at night. So he needs to hire a farmer. Again, utility-based action selection. When anyone has to make any decision, they score all of the options according to rules. We don't need to go through this, but this is how you decide who to hire. Uh, when you carry this out, you look at everyone in the town and then score them for how well they would do at this particular occupation. And then pick the highest one. No one lives in the town yet, that's why this is irrelevant now. So, let's say there was someone living in the town. But let's say it's a different town. There's 100 people, and I own a business, and I need to hire a cashier to work with. And I'm going to look at everyone in the town to decide who to extend this job offer to. And so I take that person, and at the top I start, and I say right now their score is zero. And the score represents my willingness to hire them. It's zero. So first I look at everyone that already works at my business, and I increment the score by five. So now the score for that person is 5.0. That is promotion. That's how people promote. I already want to, a cashier doesn't make sense, but if I had a manager position, I'd rather have someone that already works there. Next I say, if, by the way, I am decision maker in this scenario, if, this person in the town is in my immediate family. So if I have a son who needs a job, I'm going to hire him. So yeah, I'm going to give a ton of points to my son, right? Even more than the employee who deserves it, whoever works there. Extended family is cousins, aunts. This says, yeah, I'm not going to explain that, that uh, what the code is, but that says if you are the family member of an unemployed that already works here. So it's like, oh, we have this cashier and his brother needs a job. That's what that's uh, looking for. Of course, the, the points are getting much smaller here. Um, same thing, extended family of an employee. Uh, if you're my friend, here's the thing, uh, plus four. If you're my enemy, I don't want you to, to work there. But it's not a total deal breaker. So if you were in a town where there was actually people already there, that's how you would decide who to hire. But let's say. Uh, he obviously couldn't do this because no one lived in the town, so someone had to be generated. And we'll say the new farmhand is this guy, or no. Uh, the next step is he's going to move there. Okay. So we have to say if necessary because he might not actually, he might already live in the town. And he's just getting that job. This guy didn't. So what does he need to do? Score all the options where he wants to live. Let's say he wants to live by work too, and he also wants to have a neighbor. So I think he lives there. And now here's our town, population three. We're growing very rapidly. And we're done there, because there was only one position to hire. And so we're back to this, right? Uh, we finished the, the business one. I thought I showed it one more time. This has established a few businesses. Uh, it's randomly choosing between two and four, I think is what it is. So let's say we're going to do two more businesses. And let's say those fill in there. And let's say those are farms. And these people then move in accordingly, farmhands and farmers. And now we have 17 people. So we 
to establish a few businesses. That caused businesses to be formed, which caused owners to be generated, which caused employees to be generated, which caused everyone to move to the town. So starting a business created a town, essentially. Now we get into our core loop. So how things work is we're going to simulate uh, over and over and over until we have an interesting town. And we specifically go to an end date. So just like we specify the beginning date, we also specify the end date. The bad news, the game takes place in the summer of 1979. So that's when we're going to end. We're going to go to 1979. So this is a while loop, which I, I know you've seen. The first step in the well is to advance time. Otherwise, we would never get to the end date. Right, the current date would always be 1839. The time would, my computer would blow up, it would take up too much. So this is how we advance time. If the time of day is day, change it to night. Otherwise, change it to day. And if you change it to day, that means the day has passed. So update the date. Increment the day, if necessary, change the month. That's how we advance time. So the time step is after day. day. Okay. Then yeah, after day. Exactly. Which is why the shifts are the same thing. One day representation. Okay. <laughs> Again, to have more time. Okay. Next step in the core loop, simulate childbirth. This is the code for that. Look at everyone in the town. If someone is pregnant, and if their due date is today, have them have the child. And this causes uh, a new, a new character to enter the simulation. And uh, we already looked at that code, right? So now it's going to go down the other route because we'll have parents that are in the sim. So it's gonna inherit, they're gonna inherit personality and appearance and stuff. Let's say someone in the town is having a child today. We're going to go through this code, but it's gonna go down the other route. And then our population is gonna go up by one. So two ways the population grows, people from outside the town and then people having kids. So after we've simulated childbirth, the next step is to potentially open new businesses. This looks something like this. I'm an author in the system, so I can set the probability of a business opening just any given day or night. We roll a random number. If it's less than that chance, we open a business. That number is such that we get about one business every year, or a little less. Um, that's just how the math works out given the number of time steps. But I can turn that up or down, and that's going to change how many businesses come, which will change the population. And when we start a new business, we've already seen how that happens. We just go through the same exact process. So let's say that a new business does start, and they decide to put it right there. And let's say it's a tavern, perhaps like the one we saw in the vignette, at the beginning of the talk. But it's 1839, it's going to look different. No neon lights or anything like that. So let's say we have this tavern in the town. We're going to revisit that in a bit. So the tavern owner is going to move into the town to population 19. The next step is to potentially shut down businesses. And this is based off these chances uh, that I set at the top. It's the same principle. There's a certain chance it happens. And that chance increases, though, if, I don't have here, the business is now historically inactive. Remember at the beginning, I talked about businesses can shut down at certain years. The blacksmith shop might shut down. So that's what that step does. It says we might shut down a business on this time step. Much higher chance of shutting it down if it's now historically inaccurate. So basically, businesses just disappear within a few years of them becoming historically inaccurate. Then here's the big <laughs> move here. This says if this time step will be simulated. So we don't simulate every single time step due to uh, speed issues. It would take a long time to simulate every day and every night. And because of us being at a certain level of abstraction, it's not real time, it's just days and nights. It's just not necessary. So what we do is we simulate about 10 or 20 time steps a year, and that's enough to get a nice, rich, interesting talent. So here, it's another random number and it's a chance that I said, it's such that there's about 10 or 20 a year 
that which was simulated. And when the time step is simulated, this is where all the interesting social stuff happens. So here we say for everyone in the town, simulate life events for that character. Here's pseudocode for that particular subroutine. So there's a chance the character could die. That depends on their age and other factors. There's a chance they could propose marriage to someone if they have someone they're romantically interested in and it's mutual. Uh, there's a chance they could conceive a child. You know how that happens. There's a chance uh, that a married couple could divorce. There's a chance that someone who's working someone could retire and so forth, move out of town, uh, or move to somewhere else within town or move out of town. So these are the four life events that can occur. And we're just rolling dice. There's certain chances these things can happen to people. If the dice falls in a certain way, that person will die or retire or leave town. Then we say, once we've simulated life events for everyone, for everyone in the town, enact their routine. So every day and night, when we actually simulate it, everyone in the town looks at every place in the town and scores it for how much they want to go there right now. So let's say that this is our farmer, and it's some day well, he's going to want to go to his farm, of course, and work there. So again, there's a scoring routine which says if you work today, you probably go to work. Um, if you're not working, let's say it's nighttime now, he might want to go home. He might want to go to his neighbor's house. He might want to go to that tavern in town. So there's all these rules about where you want to go when. And that's what the character in which you uh, 17 is about. There's no slide. So he scores everything according to how much he wants to go there. Let's say that he wants to go to that tavern, that new tavern. We'll come back to him being there. So after we've done this, everyone is somewhere. Everyone in the town has gone somewhere. They've decided where they want to go, and they've gone there. Now we say for everyone in the town, given where you're at, socialize with people. Nearby. So let's say that he went to this tavern. And if we look inside here, we won't find these two because they'd be out of place. But we'll find their antecedents. <laughs> so let's say that's the farmer. Remember him from the beginning? That's his farmhand. Well, now they're going to socialize. So this is going to update their relationship. Everyone has a relationship with everyone that they met. And the relationship is characterized fundamentally in two ways. One is a notion called charge. This is platonic affinity, non-romantic, non-romantic feelings, right? Friendship. Feelings. So how this works is everyone else has a platonic affinity for everyone else that they've met. And it's just a number that evolves over time. And how it evolves, it could be negative, by the way. How it evolves is everyone else has a compatibility with everyone else, given their personalities. So that 3.23 says that that's his line. That's his, line. his compatibility with him, in the sense of how much he likes him. And so every time they interact, he's going to update that set. We'll look that number below, which is his affinity toward him, according, according to that number. So what happened there was his compatibility with him was 3.25, and he added that to his current affinity. Now he's going to do the same thing for him, because as you can see, it's asymmetric. I can like someone else and they don't like me back. I cannot like someone and they like me. We all know yeah. about that situation. <laughs> So now he's going to do the same thing and update his. So meanwhile, everyone's affinity for everyone else is going up and down. And when it crosses some threshold, now I consider that other person a friend. So me and Vincenzo see each other all the time. We interact. And every time I see him, I like him more and more. And at some point, I like him enough to call him a friend. Meanwhile, let's say he likes me less and less every time he sees me. So some threshold can be crossed on the bottom at which point he considers me an enemy of his. So I can consider him a friend, he considers me an enemy. So there's a, a number of interesting phenomena here by this very simple system. We can have two people that like each other, they both consider each other friends. 
We can have one person that likes someone else, and they don't really feel anything the other way. We can have someone that likes someone else, and that other person does not like them. Or we can have, of course, enemies. And all of these have different narrative entry rights. Typically, friends could have a certain, uh, uh, that could enable a certain kind of narrative. Two people being enemies, of course, can enable a certain kind of narrative. Uh, many narratives have a rivalry at its core. And then the asymmetric thing where people don't like each other, that has its own narrative affordances. Spark, then, is romantic opinion. And that's going to work the same way. It's symmetric appeal. Someone could be attracted to someone else, and that person is not attracted back. And again, there's a threshold. And that threshold is just that a marriage proposal may occur. So here's a case where, currently at least, we're just cutting corners. Of course, uh, romance and people's romantic lives are way more complex than that in the real world. Um, in simulation, you're always simplifying. That's something that's more simplified than we would like. We just didn't have time to introduce a dating simulation, which would be cool. It would just be a lot of work. So right now, after some threshold, uh, when the life events are simulated for someone, they might propose to that person so that uh, that person is also attracted to them and they're attracted to that. And again, we have a very simple system, people just evolving feelings according to how often they see each other, but there's all this phenomenon. People could like each other romantically. You know, one person that likes someone else, the other person doesn't feel anything. You could have someone that likes someone else, and that person is detested the other person. <laughs> and that's inherently rich. There's so many romantic copies that that's, that's what's going on. Right? And we get it. We're very cheap. Another thing about that system is that let's say that I, I've never met Vincenzo. But if, if I did, and if I spent time around him, we would become brutal enemies. We would totally become enemies. We would hate each other. But I never meet him. So of course we're not enemies. We never even met him. Let's say we do meet, and I dislike him, and he dislikes me, but we haven't spent enough time around each other to actually become enemies. So in this system, you can't become enemies unless you really spend a lot of time around each other and keep pushing down to get toward the threshold. And likewise, you can't become friends with someone unless you actually spend a lot of time with each other. So we find the strongest relationships here um, at work because people have to go to their jobs with these other people regardless. Of, that's where we find the the enmities usually. So if, if I don't like someone, I'm not going to go hang out with them at the bar or whatever. But if I have to work with them, I'm going to be around them all the time. And we're each just going to be going lower and lower on how how uh, our platonic enemies for each other. Um, and these simple things can interact in different ways. And I thought I had that here. So you can have stuff going on platonically and romantically. And that can be asymmetrical. So, oh, another thing, of course, is this person could be in love with this person, who's in love with this person, who's in love with that person, but none of them are in love with the person who's in love with them. <laughs> Again, very narratively rich, very computationally. So this is the entire talent generation. And this is a little more complex than I explained. If I'm at a bar and there's 30 people, I don't socialize with everyone, necessarily. Uh, who people socialize with depends on how extroverted they are, how good of friends they already are with someone else. But this is the algorithm. This is how a town is generated. So this is what happens for each time step. Each time step. So, oh, okay. so when we get to the end of this, we go back to the well loop. Because the current day is not the end day. Meanwhile, the town is changing. You can see a city center. That simple rule creates a city center. So over time, uh, businesses might go out of business, so that farm went away because it's becoming less relevant or whatever reason, someone didn't want to take it over. But generally things are growing and growing and growing. You can see our, our guy's farm at the top <coughs> went away after some of that case. And there might be uh, new farms that come, or there might be a new kind of business altogether that fills in where something else went. So farms go away around 1920, so that's not going to come back. But a little detail that might emerge is that uh, this was the guy who owned the farm, Arthur Earl Belden, if you recall his name. He was the guy in the bar there. They might decide to name this new business, let's say they start a park. They want a park 
to now exist on a former spot of the farm. So they might name the park after this guy. So that's the kind of like historical stuff that keeps coming back because the simulation is keeping track of all that. And when you decide to name a business, again, there's rules and you score all the options. Um, it's a little different than the other ones because there's an infinite number of possible names. Uh, but they might decide to name the park after the farmer that was there. So you see all those kinds of cool little details popping up. And then it grows. Um, it might regress at times. There's weird population dynamics that I don't even understand. It's just, again, emergent phenomena from simple procedures. But it might regress for a bit, and then it comes back even stronger. And it grows and grows until you tell it to stop. So we said stop in 1979. And once it does that, it's not going to go down the well loop into the for loop because the current table is equal to. At any other top, Lombardo, USA, 1979, population 334. So welcome to the Lombardo, <laughs> USA. So this is how I generate a town. Now we're going to see a bunch of stuff fly by. These are events that are occurring as they're occurring. This is just supposed to look wild. Almost there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Here's a, okay, what's our town? It's called Morristown, population 295. I have a little thing that looks for interesting things that have occurred throughout the history of the town. So there's been 60 business rivalries. There's been 31 love triangles. <laughs> For a population of 295, I think 31 was Yeah, it's huge. <laughs> I can turn up the, the entry. It's amazing. Here's a random person. Sally Shelton. Six four, four, Sally was a bank teller at a bank for 10 years. Now she's a waiter at Power Away Feast. Okay, nice and slow. Here's a random person. Don't worry about what I'm typing in, just worry about what it's doing. I don't want a three-year-old because they don't have to respect. Oh, this one. Here's a random person named Melvin. That's Parslow. Parslow, Utah, 1980. It's pretty nice. Very relaxed. Doesn't care about rules or obligations. Pretty outgoing. And Likes new experiences, generally. He is the owner of the Sixth Street <laughs> Cafe. So that's pretty prestigious. He's been doing that since 1974. He took it over from probably his father. His name is Melvin Parslow. He took it over from Dewey Parslow. Let me make sure that's him or his father. He took it over from his father. So we talked about family businesses, we talked about nepotism. Here it is at work. You want to know what his love life? Okay. <laughs> Melvin is, he is married or has been married. <coughs> he got married in 1950, so he's been married about 30 years. So his spouse is Patricia Parslow, but he's in love with Sally Shelton. Sally Shelton. <laughs> Here's that interface with player sees. So they have a little iPad tablet. And how it gets updated is I type in code. <laughs> so this line of code says show the prompt at the beginning, which is the character who has died. And what does look like. <laughs> so here's what the player would see. Okay. So the player. Yeah. Okay. Okay. At the beginning. That's all they know about the deceased person. Light skinned man, short black hair, silent. Now I can move the player to, let's go to a bar. Oh, there's no bar in town. I'll have them go outside. So they're speaking out loud, whatever they want to do. I have headphones on, and we have a hidden microphone. So, so I, me, I said, play, I would say, OK, now I, well, let's try to go to the bar. Exactly. Yeah, you never okay. type or anything. And I listen, and then let's say they say, I want to go outside. I would go, okay, I, I, I would go outside and be in the player. Exactly. So you I say it. Okay. Say it now. I want to go outside. Okay, outside. I type that in. 
now, and then what happened? I, that would be screened on my laptop. Exactly. On my iPad. Because yeah. <laughs> James is like, playing the Siri part. Yeah. And, uh, we call it the Wizard because it's like a Wizard of Oz uh, behind the scenes. And I'm chatting with the actor the whole time. Okay. So that's the actor. The actor takes a second to come out of the curtain because he has no idea who he is, right? This person didn't exist until you saw me just create them. So he's like, okay, I'm Max Romer. Here's my personality <coughs> at the top. And he's a professional actor. He was the star of Blue's first original series. Um, like the New York Times praised him. He's also an AI researcher. Yeah. Perfect person for this. But he's a professional improviser, so he'll do things like think about his posture and start to think about how he's going to project his voice given the personality traits. Yeah, sorry, it's hard to read. This is his color palette he picked. I think it's hard to read. Okay. <laughs>